Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for stopping by for this latest chat with friends. You know me, peoples. You know I like to get into good trouble, and this is a conversation about uh, culture and all that stuff that I've been talking about on the channel. Uh, usually it's just me kind of talking, but I am so happy to be joined by my guest. I met him virtually on the Ludology podcast. He was, a, he was a recently a guest talking about cultural consulting, which is he gets money off of this stuff. This is this <laughs> man's job. I don't know if it's a day job, but he definitely makes a lot of money off of this stuff. So I was very excited to have him on to have a conversation about culture and board games and tabletop games, all that kind of stuff. He is James Mendez Hodes. Welcome to the show. What's well, good. Thank you so much for having me. And we're calling you Mendez because we have a lot of Jameses around. Yeah, so there's too I, many Jameses in board games. <laughs> It's <laughs> way too many. Until I can find and defeat all of them, I will go by Mendez. And I'm not going to do the Jim and the Jimmy and the Jim Bob, and we're not doing all that. We're just going <laughs> to go yeah. with Mendez. Uh, People man, try it every now and then. It just doesn't stick. <laughs> So uh, actually, we're doing this. Uh, this is uh, the first of a couple of interviews that I'm doing during May, which is Asian American Pacific Islander Appreciation Month. Uh, my friend over here is, I believe, from the Philippines or yeah, Filipino yeah, descent. my mom's yeah, my mom is uh, is Filipino American. All right. So um, so in spirit of that, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to have a couple of guests on here before we get started. And I, I know I didn't give you too much warning about this, but you you know the drill. You've been on the, a lot of these uh, shows. Oh, yeah. Um, tell me, tell us a little bit about your gamer story, but tell us yeah. about like your cultural background and how, you know, you came to games in, the, in that context. Yeah, yeah, for real. Um, so, um, my, my first interaction with tabletop gaming, I think was when I was, uh, when I was a kid finding old advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition books at, uh, Barnes and Noble. Did you grow up um, in the states, or did you grow up on the? Yeah, um, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in in New York. Um, I grew up in the uh, um, in the in the greater New York metropolitan area, like a couple different couple different places. And in New York, concrete I jungle know. where dreams are. Yes. Yes. Oh no! Another Zoom's, one. Zoom's gonna throw it off. We can't sing together. It's gonna like <laughs> the sync's gonna be all awful. I apologize to everybody for that, but. We were both on pitch though, so that's absolutely that's what's make it happen. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, I remember like getting all these AD and D, these old AD and D books, uh, you know, that were like old and like discounted by that time, and nobody else wanted them, but I wanted all of them. And um, my the first book that I ever got was the Complete Thief's Handbook for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition. And I loved it. I was so into it. It was this complex world of like these warring thieves guilds and like all these different kinds of like crime and vice. And I thought like, this is awesome. I bet all of Dungeons and Dragons is like this. Yeah, like and then the I got the book rest actually of... had, cause you had like assassins in oh, there. Yeah. You know, you had all these different like, you know, uh, people creating shenanigans and like diplomats mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. That's the good stuff. Yeah, and like as as a as a kid, that was like that was just mind blowing. Like imagining all these different specialties working together in this like heist situation, um, you know. And I hadn't like I was too young to I hadn't seen Ocean's Eleven anything like that. But right. like that kind of laid the groundwork for that. And I always wanted to find uh, other kids uh, to play these games with. But I was pretty socially anxious as a kid, so I had I had a tough time, uh, you know, making friends, making other nerd friends. Um, so for, for a long time, um, I just did like video games and I did like, I did forum role playing when I was in high school. I bet there's some of you out there that did, did that. Um, you know, like you make up a character, you pretend to be so your favorite video game character on like an internet forum and like mm -hmm. you fight with each other and like canon's all weird because it's like characters from Sonic the Hedgehog and Final Fantasy. And it's like, this was years before Smash Brothers ever happened. So, you know, we couldn't imagine that. Mm -hmm. Um uh, but yeah, so it was mostly video games up until I got to college. And then when I got to college, uh, my roommate, um, my roommate introduced me to the old World of Darkness games. So like mm -hmm. Vampire the Masquerade and Chains LARP Retrieving. Yeah. yeah, all that. Um, uh, no, I didn't do I didn't do LARPs. I didn't get into LARPing until much later. Mm -hmm. um, but I was doing the uh, we, we played all the tabletop games and uh, I was so I was mostly into those. Um, I didn't I didn't get into that many board and card games. Um, I guess up until just recently, like being able to get to to go to conventions, and like I never really thought that like they were for me. I couldn't you know I felt like oh I can't do math for that many hours. I just want to like tell stories and stuff. Um, 
but then uh, the the card game that kind of changed my mind and made me realize, okay, there is some stuff that I will get into was uh, Sentinels of the Multiverse. Yes. Um, yeah, and I, like, the experience that I had was, like, I heard other people talking about it. I was, like, superheroes, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I found out it was co-op, and I thought that was cool. Um, and then the experience that, like, changed my mind about it was I was at a convention. I think it was a, one of the PAX, uh, PAX Easts, and I was walking by a table, and I heard people playing Sentinels of the Multiverse. And they were describing what was going on in the game. And I realized that if I didn't know that it was a card game, I would think they were describing a role-playing game yeah. because it was so character-driven and action-driven. Mm -hmm. And like there was so much narrative just in the interplay of the cards. And so I learned Sentinels of the Multiverse and I got like hooked, obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just had Christopher Bedell on the show talking about the latest Kickstarter. Are you in yeah. on the rebranded Kickstarter? Or are you am, good with I'm, the old stuff? I'm in on the, I'm in on the rebranded Kickstarter. I was like, I was cautious at first, but they, they sold me on it. And, yeah. um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I also got, uh, for the, on the role-playing game side, I also, I really like a lot of things about the, the Sentinel comics RPG as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be on one of the upcoming books, uh, dealing with the Rook City setting and, Yes, exactly is. that one. For the podcast um, listeners, I'm holding up a copy of Sentinel Comics, a role-playing book. Uh, might, I might uh, create some content about this and tell everybody all about it. We'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah, go through. I recommend going through the, the character creation system for that game is the most fun character creation system like I have yet seen. I can just nice. make characters for hours and be completely happy. <laughs> I got to check a look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so okay so like you i mean it sounds like a pretty um not typical you know journey but like you know this stuff this stuff this stuff and kind of like cohering yeah. um when i did the i did a, a panel on a lot of latino creators a couple of weeks ago and one of the threads that came out of that was that their their gamer journey was kind of on their own and with their friends mm -hmm. and like didn't get a lot of you know family buy-in in fact, yeah. there was a lot of like resistance even because like, what are mm -hmm. you doing? You're wasting your time or, you know, you should be studying. You should be this, you should be that. So like, mm -hmm. it was definitely kind of like a black sheep scenario. Did you, did you encounter a little bit of that in your family background? Um, you know, a little bit. I think I had a, um, you know, I'm always, I'm always railing against the, like the, the tiger mom stereotype and like the, you know, the, the oppressive Asian parent, the oppressive immigrant parent uh, stereotype. But um, I did, I did, I did live that growing up. I had a, it's a stereotype uh, mom, for a reason. I mean, and it plays yeah. out differently, but it, it does happen. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so for, so my mom, um, the Filipino side of my family um, are mestizo. So um, about 2% of Filipinos uh, are considered mestizo. Meaning what is that mestizo? They have, uh, that means that you have significant uh, Spanish ancestry, at least in your family history. Practically speaking, the actual specifics of who is and isn't Spanish in the Philippines are very complicated right. and very often have to do with like political factors or identitarian factors. Mm -hmm. um, I claim Spanish than, heritage to get this thing and get that thing and whatever. Right, exactly. So, so um, talking about like how Spanish we are, um, is there, there's all kinds of other social and economic and political factors that are uh, bound up in it. But um, for a lot of mestizo families, one of the things uh, that you grow up with is this aspiration to like uh, Europeanness, um, to mm. aspire into like European values, European manners, and uh, being able to interface with like the high culture of Europe and like mm -hmm. Western civilization. Uh, I'm doing scare quotes for the podcast listeners. Um, <laughs> yep. So that's um, so that we was, heard it in that, the tone of your voice, man. Western civilization. Yeah, exactly. So like growing up, you know, I did Latin, I did Greek, I learned some French, I learned some Italian. Um, like all of those like European values. Uh, were were really uh, like inculcated in me starting like pretty early on, and my parents, um, you know, they wanted me to like I learned violin, and my mom, who's a you know a talented musician, she you know put me through my paces with like violin and piano and other instruments, um, and yeah, I was just I was doing homework and uh, doing like really intense extracurriculars um, like a lot of the time, and uh, I didn't spend a huge amount of time uh, like having like that. What I think of as like the suburban kid experience, like when I'd watch like kids on the suburbs on TV and you could just go to your friend's house, like, you know, go over there on your bike without like planning it out ahead of time um, and just kind of do whatever for an afternoon. That, that was not often in my life. And 
I was also like into weird different stuff. Like even as a little kid, I was like, you know, I was into poetry and I, I wasn't like, I wasn't that into like organized sports. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we, I think like weird stuff uh, appealed to me and it wasn't really until college that I finally like uh, started fitting in um, started finding people who were like validating all different parts of my identity. Um, and that was also the first time when like getting to college, that was when I was really starting to uh, like come into my own identity, like as a person of color and have like, cause before that I was like, I was kind of on that colorblindness tip. I was all like, oh, I don't want to be judged by my race. I want to be, I want to define myself apart from apart from my my ethnic identity. And Not the color of your skin, but the content of your character. Yeah, exactly, right? And then it wasn't until, it, even through college, I think it took until the end of college for me to like really put together what the stakes were mm. and why that idea of colorblindness was like denying a bunch of people's experience and why that idea of colorblindness also had made me um, like unaware of a lot of the, the racial and ethnic factors that really affected my upbringing. But like, once I, once that, I put that together, I was able to look back and I think, well, wait a second. The first things I remember of being on the playgrounds near where I grew up was being on the playground and having other kids ask me, are you Japanese or Chinese? Mm. And I would like explain where the Philippines was as if that was like a normal conversation to have with another little kid who was black or white or Latino or something. Um, and once like, once I figured that out I was finally able to like draw a pattern through all of my experiences growing up where like all these times when I was like I I thought that they were acting weird towards me because I was a nerd and a little bit of it was that but then also there was something else going on and like I I didn't I didn't totally understand that until like college and after Mm -hmm. And that, you know, like that folds into one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today, which is to describe your current work. So oh, right yeah, now yeah. you turn whatever that was, that college education, that college experience, mm-hmm. and uh, the realization that you have made into work, like actual, yes. actual work that do people pay yeah. you for and you create value for the industry. Uh, you yeah. are what they call a cultural consultant. Yeah. So maybe I wanted to, you know, have you on as an experienced cultural consultant to, you know, introduce what kind of work you do and how you create value for tabletop games, role-playing games, the people that hire you. Definitely. So um, a cultural consultant uh, helps other creatives uh, to create media that is that represents uh, diverse identities, especially marginalized identities, especially marginalized identities that the creator does not share in an affirming and validating and uplifting manner. Um, the, the jokey way that I describe this is that people pay me to tell them that they're racist. Um, and that's not, that's not untrue, but, um, like I, you know, there is some of that. Um, and, but being a cultural consultant is more than that because to be a good cultural consultant, you got to add value. You can't just tell someone you're wrong about this. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them, um, you're wrong, but let's talk about ideas about what you could do instead. That would be uh, both like better to other people, um, and would also make your game better and more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, there's something I go over on my channel all the time and I'm going to say, mm-hmm. I'm going to keep on saying it over and over and over again. It's why I don't like the term cancel culture, at least for what I'm trying to do mm-hmm. or for what, you know, people like yourself and, yeah. you know, in the gaming industry you're trying to do, it's probably better to, to use, refer to it as call out culture. Like we're going to call out stuff, but mm-hmm. I think, you know, Mendez and I both share, we, we don't want to cancel anything. We want to, you know, try to make it better, quote unquote, yeah. more accessible to more people. And if you get attached to the old thing, well, I mean, we, there's not much that we can do. At least, you know, we're going through the process of like, you know, getting our hands dirty, working through it and trying to offer something new. Right. And even at like, even at your most mercenary, like if you imagine it from my perspective, imagine if like all of this was an act, like I'm on, like this is some kind of like virtue signaling thing, like people always trying to accuse you of, even from like, and I'm just trying to make money, even from that perspective, I have an interest in people continuing to try and fail to represent diverse cultures because if you if if you try and fail if you mess it up then we can we can call you out we can criticize you we can talk about it and then we can get better at it mm-hmm. um, because everything that I know as a cultural consultant everything I tell other people to do um, 
is a mistake that I've made at some point in my life. It's like some racist or sexist or anti-gay thing that I've done in my life. And the only times that I get to dodge that, the only times I get to know something that I didn't get wrong first are when I'm lucky enough uh, to see somebody else do it first. Sure. Um, so even at like the most mercenary, I have this huge interest in people continuing to try and fail. Because if you just erase us, then there's there's no way to improve. One thing people always ask is like how I how I ended up doing this. Um, yes. Okay. That that's exactly the question I was going to ask. Like how yeah. did like did you get a degree in cultural consulting? Did you take the certificate course? Uh, so so I was a I was a bad student in college, and I did what was what I was interested in because otherwise I just couldn't finish a paper. So I majored in religion, focusing on West African and Afro-Atlantic religions. Nice. Um, so stuff like uh, Candomblé, Lukumi, Palo Mayombe, um, all, the, all the religions created by uh, enslaved Africans in the Americas, as well as West African religion, which was its, which was its root. Um, and I did that because I liked the teacher, Dr. Yvonne Chereau at Swarthmore. Um, mm. And uh, I minored in dance, focusing on uh, martial arts and North Indian classical dance, because again, it's like, it's what I like to do. Um, and I had a minor in English, uh, in English lit. Um, and then uh, in graduate school, uh, I got my master's in Eastern classics. So like great books of Japan, China, and India, like reading all the great, like the Buddhist and Taoist classics, um, you know, and uh, following like the, the Buddha and Lao Tzu, and, and all them like from India through China to, to Japan. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I did all that stuff cause I was interested in it. And at the end I was like, oh damn, I'm never gonna get a job. <laughs> um, so You're talking like, to a philosophy religion major, you myself. So exactly. that, that, I needed to whip up that some of that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, somewhere. so I would just, you know I'd go to conventions and I'd play role playing games cause that's what I like to do. And then eventually uh, people started hiring me to to write role playing games, mm. and I realized that they were hiring me to write all the stuff that uh, white people, which was most of the people working in role playing games, most of the people playing role playing games, stuff white people were too scared to write. Right. Um, so I was uh, I was writing about uh, my my first job ever. Um, I was I was hired by another person of color, but to work on Magpie Games, uh, Urban Shadows, Dark Streets, to write the the Bronx, Manhattan, and uh, Staten Island settings, um, and then from that there was like a, a series of games that I worked on, and then my first full time job in gaming was with Seventh uh, C Second Edition, um, okay. coming out of John Wick Presents in 2016, um, and then uh, after John Wick Pre John Wick Presents folded, um, I went freelance, and that was difficult for a while is still difficult but um it's uh, currently it's my it's my full-time job mm. um although that job now is uh, it's much less writing and much more cultural consulting um i realized that like after so long writing stuff that was about um you know diverse cultures and doing all this research myself i realized i could like th there was more good i could do helping other people mm -hmm. with what they were making than spending all my time writing stuff myself. Cause like at the end of five hours of writing, you know, it's cool, but I feel tired. Whereas at the end of five hours of telling people they're racist, turns out I feel <laughs> energized. So it's a much- We're just kidding. He doesn't really do that. <laughs> 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 I can't, I cannot stretch like, like even like thinking about it seriously, I cannot just stretch the words you are racist out for five entire hours. I tried, <laughs> it doesn't work. I had to come up with something else to like, right. you know, keep people from like falling apart or falling asleep. Um, so yeah, um, uh, so that's, that's how I ended up doing cultural consulting. Like I started out just kind of doing the work myself and then eventually I was like, I keep doing this kind of by accident. I might as well do it on purpose. Okay, and so, like we talked in a general way, but let's get a little bit specific about like the kinds of things, you know, that could go wrong, so to speak, yeah, sure. in, a, in a manual. So we're talking, I mean, how much of your work is dealing with and undoing stereotypes? Um, is that a significant amount of the work or is there like other stuff happening too? Uh, that, I mean, that's a significant amount of the work, but I, I wouldn't say it's like the majority. Okay. Um, it really, it really depends a lot from, uh, from piece to piece. Uh, but I think if, if my job were mostly identifying and undoing stereotypes, um, it would be a lot easier than it is. <laughs> um, Fair. Yeah. I think that like, it's weird because like the, all of the worst stuff, all of the, like 
the most serious problems are often the easiest to communicate. Um, you know, I can be like, well, there's a clan hood and a burning cross. I think maybe <laughs> you shouldn't do this. Right. Then people will be like, oh, right, because the KKA is racist. Ah, mm. that was easy. Um, and I wish it were that easy all the time, but usually it's not. Usually it's things that are that are a lot subtler um, or it's things which aren't necessarily apparent from like a quick read through of the text. But I know from like long experience in gaming, long experience seeing how people react to things, um, I know that when someone takes a thing that you made um, with good intentions and then they go and they do something with it themselves, um, mm. then suddenly there's going to be problems. Suddenly there's going to be context that is taken out of and context that you didn't, you didn't want to be there that is going to get added to it. Mm. And then that's going to be where the problems are. Um, Interesting. And okay. So sometimes like you, sometimes it's like, well, I guess this isn't going to do as much damage as a burning cross. But then on the other hand, burning crosses tend not to, they tend not to make it through the filter. People tend mm -hmm. to notice that stuff and then reject it. Right. Whereas I, it's the little things um, that like the little nickel and diming stuff, um, what we sometimes refer to as microaggressions or sometimes call like stealth aggressions, like that's the stuff that really adds up because that's the stuff that makes it through people's filters most easily. And it just like sits there. So like when you on Ludology, and I remember talking about this uh, significantly too, but about orcs and you have like yeah. a big thing about orcs and like you look at it and it doesn't look like a stereotype. Like if I showed it to an alien and I was like, okay, what does this orc look like? It looks like a monster, whatever, whatever. But then, yeah. you know, and, and even if the original intent is to make like, you know, whatever the, you know, a, a flesh out the orc system mm -hmm. and everything, once you get that, you know, now everybody's role-playing off of it. Now everybody's kind of yeah. making fiction off of it. Certain things kind of like sift out. So maybe you can describe a little bit about the yeah. things that sift out that can cause problems. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so talking about orcs, for example, so my first introduction to orcs was uh, when my friend showed me Warcraft. Uh, I went over to my friend's house and he's like, I got this game called Warcraft Orcs and Humans. And he showed me this game, which was, you know, it's pretty simple. There's orcs fighting humans. Uh, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. So there's just like these two species fighting. It's not that big a deal. Okay. Uh, there isn't like a, like a whole plot. And he was like, oh, no, no. Oh, there is a plot. Um, and this was before, you know, Tides of Darkness had come out. He just showed me the, the first uh, Warcraft game. Um, and then Warcraft 2, Tides of Darkness, I got it as soon as it came out and I played it and I loved the orcs. I was so into them. And you know, they had problems, they had stereotypes. There was all kinds of problems with orcs. Sure. Um, but uh, I was so into them. I thought they were, I thought they were so cool. Um, you know, I loved it. Uh, you know, they were, you know, big green jack badasses and, you know, humans didn't like them, but they were trying to make their way in the world. And, you know, they were morally complex. I, so I was, I was so into orcs. I was like, yes, these guys are awesome. Um, and I started to identify with them just because like, not because I, I saw them at, at first, not because I saw them as people of color, because I hadn't put that together. I think that was right. a part of it, but I didn't like figure that out until much mm -hmm. later. But I was always like, I was just always into guys who were like, you know, a little bit bad. I was always into like, you know, the evil overlord, um, it, you know, who was like opposing the heroes, you know, people who are like making moves, uh, you know, behind the scenes and that kind of thing. Like, I always thought that those characters were, were really interesting. Um, and um, a lot of them were, you know, coded as outsiders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the queer coding of villains or the racial coding of villains. Um, so I think that I, a lot of the things that made me identify um, with orcs or with a lot of these uh, villainous characters, um, they were things that had kind of sifted through. I didn't really get that they, uh, that feeling of being an outsider um, was a racial experience until I was much older and I was much better able to, to understand that because I was surrounded by people who were like, well, none of us are racist. You know, this is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is, uh, we're all educated, well-meaning people. Nobody's like, nobody's really racist on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, no so secret clan was, meetings, no, exactly. uh, you know, uh, visits to whatever sites or David Duke or yeah. Jordan Peterson, none, none of that stuff. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't put that together. And I just assumed the best about everybody. Um, so, uh, so I was already like, I, I, much later in life, I was like, oh man, well, orcs are really cool. Um, but it's weird how they're, you know, they're just brutal and violent all the time and why they've got all these stereotypes about like savagery and, right. you know, they're big and tough, but they're not very smart. 
And why, why is, why is that? Um, and growing up on Warcraft, I didn't think that way about orcs. I thought orcs were like, you know, uh, cunning and, and smart. And even in, uh, even in uh, like games workshop games, like orcs were brutal, but cunning. Um, so I was like, it, you know, it seems like someone done them wrong. And it seems like they're always referred to as a race, like a fantasy race. So, you know, you can't hear race uh, in the context of a fantasy race and like never think, never in your life think that that has something to do with like a human race or a, right. um, like there's people out there because they always come to me on Twitter and they always say, I never made that association. And you're the racist for noticing that like, well, I'll get to that. Come on, man. I'll get to that. Um, so, so that was when I started looking back into it and I was like, huh, well, I guess I should look at Tolkien because that's really the, the origin of orcs as we know them. And then I started reading, uh, you know, I hadn't read Lord of the Rings since I was in like fifth grade. And like when I read it in fifth grade, I like blazed through it because I thought it was boring. Um, but so I went back to Tolkien and then I found this, this quote where Tolkien talks about how the orcs are uh, explicitly stated to be um, like these short, squat, slant-eyed, swarthy Mongol types. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if you go to my go to my website, uh, you can the, the quotes up there. Or you look up Tolkien's letter number two hundred ten. Uh, he explicitly states this, and I was uh, I was gobsmacked because um, I, I thought that growing up in America, I, I think a lot of the closest stereotypes or the the portrayals of orcs that I thought were most upsetting when I saw them um, compared orcs to um, African or indigenous people. Um, like there were, um, like when they were in illustrations in like D and D books or fantasy books, they had like a bunch of indigenous signifiers, um, or they were described as like being in tribes or being savage and primitive, you know, people, people talking down about orcs the same way that they talk down about like people from countries they don't understand. Um, but then I went back to Tolkien and it turned out that he had this conception of orcs as being like, uh, like the Turco-Mongol peoples or Chinese people. Um, and like the, the more that I looked at it and the more that I thought about the way that Tolkien wrote about orcs, the more I realized um, that he was basing them on um, these ideas about um, martial races mm -hmm. and uh, these ideas of these theories of scientific racism uh, that were common in uh, the British military and British academia, respectively, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and back then, like those ideas were like, like Tolkien wasn't being notably racist by believing those things. He was being like normal for a, for an English guy. Um, like he, you know, he'd grown up in in South Africa and then England, and then he, you know, he went to war. Um, so he wasn't even like particularly racist by the standards of his time like it was they lovecraft, were yeah yeah like lovecraft yeah. everyone knew that guy was racist even the other racists were like man that guy's kind of uh, <laughs> i don't know about that cat yeah. um so um but tolkien i think was like kind of normal and well-meaning and then there were other times in his life when he said uh you know very sympathetic things about various marginalized groups but right. in and lord of the I, rings like the thing about like racism right is yeah. we think it's hatred Right. Mm -hmm. And like you hate another race. And yeah. yes, there that is the obvious KKK kind of stereotype. Mm -hmm. but like that's almost like the tip of the iceberg. Like there's so much mm -hmm. else into it. It's not about hatred. It's just about mindset yeah. and what you see when you see another a person of a different race or your race or whatever it is. And what mm -hmm. is what's your mindset filtering in and what's your mindset filtering out? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's much less kind of like, you know, oh, he hates or he this, that, their thing. We don't want to say that. Like, we want to say, mm -hmm. like, do you have a mind, do you have a mind frame that mm -hmm. sees, you know, like, it sees like, like, the, like the British mind frame was it, it filtered things through whether they want to lost a war. So mm -hmm. like, if they won yeah. a war, the race was, you know, pliant and whatever. Mm -hmm. And if they lost the war, like, oh, it's a know, martial like, race. That's why it's we a martial race. <laughs> Yeah, the Maori are martial, and the exactly yeah, the Zulus are martial because we managed to like totally mess that up. Yeah, and like because they keep on rebelling, we can't put them down, so they must be like a, a martial stock. And it's like yeah. that's okay. And I'm sure there was a there was hatred in that because they were frustrated, but like it's just yeah. you know the just the, a world a mindset thing. And mm -hmm. you know, like I, I had a whole video, like you know, not everybody's racist, but everybody is biased. Mm -hmm. and like that Definitely. bias kind of like filters through and we're just and this whole project is about unpacking and your project is about unpacking 
all the bias and you know like putting it out there and exactly. let's, let's discuss it mm -hmm. definitely um so yeah i think that um and i think right now we live in a time in history when we can um we can look outside and we can look at current events and um we are both blessed and cursed with an ability um you know to look at the news and see how um see how all of the little things um can pile up until um eventually a big thing happens um because people don't um people don't decide to attack asian grandmas just out of nowhere right um there's there's a process of stuff getting built up and that's a combination of like internal and external factors there's other kinds of acculturation there's things that they learn from the culture around them and that's the people around them and that's also books and movies and video games and stuff and it's like video games don't they don't make you violent um like reading a book about violence doesn't necessarily make you violent mm -hmm. but they do influence your ideas about violence they do okay. influence how you think about violence and um uh the things that uh, i think the things that uh kind of dig the hardest into unconscious bias are like when stuff isn't stated outright, when everything, all the media that you encounter just makes an assumption. Um, and it's just always assumed that like a certain thing is gonna be the case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and nobody ever like, nobody ever talks about it. I think those are the ideas that are most likely um, to like settle into that level of like unconscious or implicit bias um, in your head. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Tony Chapman, who I've interviewed over on my website, talks about this like in, in much more detail and gets into like the 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 psychology about it. But like, uh, yeah, it's it's like what we were talking about earlier with what gets through people's filters. If you say something, if you say an idea outright, then it's easy to like take it or leave it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if violence is on the cover, then we understand we're going to think about violence. Um, but then if there's a bunch of ideas about race in that work that are like seeded through it and they're subtle, yeah, uh, subliminal subliminal right yeah mm -hmm. okay um so um okay so i think that lays a good ground of like you know who you are how you got here what you do and why it's important or why you think it's important mm -hmm. so i wanted i didn't want to just leave it there because i do have a lot of people who interact with my channel and i have a culturally you know kind of oriented mm -hmm. channel and my rule about this stuff is like as you know I, I don't mind if you disagree just engage, like engage in good faith. And, you know, we will, we will go back and forth. So I want to take some of the disagreements and kind of offer them to you and see how you respond. And Definitely. you've hit a couple of them just kind of like in your discussion. So talking about like, you know, you didn't really realize it until like college and college is like when the light bulb went on mm -hmm. and then talking about like media and, you know, different things, what the, what the, a moderate critique would be, would be like, okay, you got indoctrinated, right? So like that's, you know, colleges indoctrinate you and then now modern education indoctrinates you into the, you know, the, the, the dogma of wokeness, right? Mm -hmm. So like now you, now because you were indoctrinated in college and because media feeds you this stuff, okay, uh, some Asian grandmas are getting like assaulted. What about these other grandmas that are not getting covered? They're not getting mm -hmm. assaulted. The media is picking and choosing what they're, what they're showing you and making, you know, people who are kind of like, wrapped up in this stuff convinced that okay wow we live in a racist society so what do you what would you say to like this idea that like this isn't like we say we see it but they say no you don't you, you're you know you're being indoctrinated you're not you're seeing stuff that's not actually really there so um so i i, I see this so something that surprises me about this this argument is that if someone tells me like i'm being indoctrinated by the left um I'm like, okay, so there's like a like a buildup of media images uh, over a long period of time from like the I guess like the the liberal media, the leftist media that they think exists, mm -hmm. um, and over time that's like slowly indoctrinating me until I think that it's truth because it's actually like a cultural source that's given me that idea. Right. Well, that's the idea that I always talk about with cultural consulting. That's what we were just describing, what we were just discussing in terms of like how people get like racist ideas put in their heads. Um, they, they get these unconscious biases, they get those ideas and they do, those, those ideas influence them. Um, so uh, with regard to the indoctrination, um, 
well, I'll definitely admit to being like the product of my experiences. Um, and like, yeah, sometimes it's ideas from the media, but then um, most of the ideas that I have about how race and racism work um, come from like personal experience of real life and from seeing how people react to my ethnicity, other people's ethnicities around me, paying attention to all that stuff. Um, so like I watch it happen. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely the product of my experiences. I would never deny being that. And uh, some of that, some of that's like, I guess the news, I don't watch the news that much. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think we're, uh, when people say you're indoctrinated, the, the term indoctrinate, it, that implies that like, you, you didn't have any agency and you never considered it. Okay. You never, um, that these ideas happened and you, um, uh, they, they were stuck in your head and you never considered that like actually they came from a biased source. Um, and for me- Yeah, I mean, uh, the, well, the idea being that, you know, the leftist liberal media likes to, you know, like they have a vision of how the world should be and they're kind of against heartland people. They're against like conservative people and like that, that they're, so they're indoctrinating young, young intelligent folks like yourself or like myself who is not so young, but whatever. Uh, and that, you know, like what basically the result being that what, when we experience things or see things like we're actually seeing, like we're actually like, let's say it's, you know, um, just as an example, go to a con and, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's a, I'm trying to find a game and there's a table full of like, you know, white men and they say, okay, we're full up, right? And so, uh, you know, um, are we in, indoctrinated or like, are we predisposed to say, well, that's a racist act. How could you, you, you ban me because, you know, of uh, you, you, you have a problem with the color of my skin or your problem with that. And I, I think like, that's, the, you know, and, and the people at the table are like, well, that's not, you know, you, you're welcome to come here. We just happen to be full. Why are you calling me a racist for? Like, I know that's like, I'm being hypothetical, yeah, yeah. but I think that's kind of how a modern person kind of sees it, where it's like, you know, they're just like living and doing whatever. And then we're the one that's, that are bringing in this kind of extra layer of stuff. Yeah. So um, I think that, so the, the conversation about indoctrination, whenever people talk about like indoctrination, echo chambers, um, there's the implication that people are experience, having experiences and then consuming media and then never thinking critically about them. Um, right. And I think for a, for a long time in my life, like as a kid, that was definitely how I looked at a lot of media. Um, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't, I took things at face value. I assumed like this is the way that the world works. Um, and so I, for me, um, you know, I talked earlier about my experiences, like thinking of the world in terms of colorblindness and then having to like have that questioned and think critically about that and then realizing, oh, okay, race does influence things. Um, so I think that um, the question about like, talking about like you're indoctrinated, um, uh, people who say that um, they're implying that you never think critically, you never question, you never doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I, I didn't, I, I always, I think of my personal problem as I doubt too much, like just knowing my own personality. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and uh, I had like a, I had a very like authoritarian uh, mindset growing up. If someone else uh, disagreed with me, I emotionally assumed that they were right. Cause like my parents were always right. And my teachers were always right. So, um, and I still have that reaction when someone says like, hey, I think you're wrong about this. Even in just like a Twitter conversation. If it's like, you know, someone with a Hitler avatar and one follower also like, and they say they disagree with me. My first emotional response is like, oh yeah, maybe Hitler avatar is right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I think right. that like, I, I think that everyone, I think everyone is indoctrinated from that perspective. I think everyone consumes all of these like media ideas, which have a bias, mm -hmm. you know, and our textbooks have biases. Our TV has biases. Everything that we consume has biases. So um, I think the question, the, the difference between being indoctrinated and not is whether you question the biases and the identity of the sources that you're getting. Right. Um, which is what I was trying to do by investigating Tolkien and thinking like, well, Tolkien describes orcs in this way. Um, what are the biases that might have gone into Tolkien's portrayal of these orcs? And then when other people portrayed orcs in different ways, when I saw orcs in D&D &D or Warcraft or board game, 
like who's creating that and what kinds of influences do they have mm -hmm. um, that are influencing that? And right. I think like if I got if I got anything really important out of a college education, it was um, uh, and not just from classes, but also of like you know people calling me on stuff. It was the instinct to do that. So um, it's I, I wouldn't say no, I'm not indoctrinated. I'd say we're all indoctrinated. And it's just a question of like, can we interrogate that? Can we look critically at that? And that's a constantly adjusting process because we're constantly consuming new stuff. Right. And that's exactly why I wanted to have this particular conversation the way I wanted to have it, because I don't want just want to preach to the choir. I don't want to like, okay, well, everybody who agrees with cultural consulting, watch my channel. Yeah. Like I want to investigate this stuff and I want to like kind of take some of this stuff head on. Yes, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I, I questioned myself. It's like, okay, really? Is it really that bad? It's like, and then it's like, well, yeah, it's that bad. But, but yeah, and then whatever. But I, I go through that process. I just want to kind of make that clear. Exactly. Um, you mentioned another another one, and this is a little bit more kind of like, you know, you know, face to face, interpersonal of mm -hmm. like, you're the one always mentioning race. You're the racist, mm -hmm. right? And you're the one like, and this comes up like all the time. Uh, you know, it comes up maybe like every, almost like every other day on like some form or another of like, you know, um, name me a black content creator or name me, a, you know, female list of designers. And it's like, why does it have to be that important? You're just dividing us. That is not, you know, why can't we just be people? Why can't we just play games? Uh, I, it goes to the colorblindness thing, but like this idea specifically that talking about race and gender divides and that, yeah. you know, if we just, allow the natural process of like, you know, the just arc of justice bends upward. You know, we have way more female designers, black, you know, creators in our hobby than we had, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Just let it keep going. Don't, you know, by introducing all this stuff, we're basically ruining it. Yeah. Um, you know, so how do you, how, have you encountered that and how do you deal with it? So, you know, I, uh, my problem with that is almost that there's like too many responses, but like yeah. coming from many different places. Um, but uh, like I start with like, well, I talk about this stuff because I enjoy it. Uh, I think it's fun. Uh, like I'm enjoying our conversation right now. And I studied this kind of thing in college and started looking into it because like I thought it was cool. And by, because like looking at like the diversity of human viewpoints and looking at the way that like you know, racial ideas that, you know, race, which is this like nearly intangible, like nearly biologically like invisible idea, um, which ends up, you know, nevertheless affecting all of our lives. Like I thought that that was just fascinating. Um, and like, you know, maybe some of that was like quote unquote indoctrination from like seeing cartoons and playing games growing up and like being interested in like the diversity of things. And that started with like, I think, you know, that starts as early as like young childhood and, you know, having like, maybe you have like five Matchbox cars and it's cool because they're, they're different. And you imagine them like being on a team and you look at the differences between them, like, that's cool. Um, and I think that like, it's that idea that I'm carrying forward when I'm advising people to do cultural consulting. So partly like I'm making race to bet, making it about race because I like it and like, that's people weird surprised. to people. Like, I think some people think like that like, talking about race can only divide. Right. right. Like if I, if I didn't enjoy talking about race, then I, I wouldn't do it for a job, but I think it's fascinating. Um, right. So that's just on the level of like, I just like talking about it. Why are you going to tell me like, you know, people talk about all kinds of stuff. That's not very interesting. People can have like a two hour conversation about loot boxes. Um, and I can't do that. <laughs> I don't care that much about or loot like, boxes or in these forums, it's like, okay, name the best worker placement game or name the best, like, you know, uh, give me a, yet another list of deck builders. What's your favorite tiny epic game? Right. Like, it, like, I, and I'm not going to like, I'm not in that conversation, but I'm not going to like fault somebody for enjoying that conversation, like having that emotional response. So like, I'm liking this, why not keep doing it? So that's just on like right. the, the enjoyment level. And then on the, like, if we want to talk about like moral or ethical imperatives or something like that, um, like if we're going there, then I think that uh, I think the, the perspectives of marginalized people like historically get shut out. I think that they don't uh, get talked about unless people go out of their way to uh, draw attention to them. Right. Um, I think that that's like, that's uh, definitely a thing. And then in terms of like uh, making everything about race, um, 
I don't know, like with with orcs, with orcs, I'm just gonna put my hands up and be like, blame Tolkien, y'all. Um, That's right there. Read it. <laughs> I didn't like, you know, coming as a as a kid, I was just like, oh, they're green and they have tusks. That's cool, right? That's how it, it started with like me just enjoying it. And then like for me, I was like, well, why does everybody make they? Why are they called a race? Why why do they use these same words to talk about orcs that racists use when they're denigrating me and my friends? Why do Oh, and then I, I went back and I, I looked at Tolkien. And I was like, well, maybe Tolkien was like in the original conception of this. Maybe he wasn't making it about. And then I saw that letter. And then I looked at all the descriptions of orcs throughout the whole of Lord of the Rings. And I was like, oh, I wasn't making it about race. Tolkien made it about race. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it feels like when people are like, well, why are you making it about race? And I was like, well, I'm like, well, I, I can't unsee it. Now that it turns out that Tolkien mm -hmm. built it into like the very building blocks of how he invented this, mm -hmm. uh, I can't, it's hard not to think about it when they use the same word race that people use to talk about like um, this conception of the idea in, in the real world. Um, it's, we're humans. We draw patterns between things. We draw associations between things. Like it's what we do, like with our primate brains, like that's, that's our strength as you know sapient mm -hmm. beings so of course we're going to like draw connections between things and then as far as like my own experience when i'm like yeah i think that this has to do with race based on my experience as a person of color and then people are like you making that up like what can i like what can you do in a conversation when like you say hey this is my experience and instead of someone saying like well what if it's this other thing or like engaging with you and engaging with the fact that you had an experience that made you think about something a certain way or if you're a person of color you've had a lifetime of experiences that made you think that way because you were forced to pay attention to something which other people who conform to the mythical norm don't have to pay attention to um yeah i just feel they, like, like just they invalidate your experience you right, know they just exactly. like saying it's like you know it's not about like i agree to disagree it's about like no you're putting something in there that's not there Right. Yeah. And if they, so if people are saying like, oh, you're making it up, you're adding this. I'm like, well, I just wanted orcs to be cool. Um, so go to the people who made them not cool by drawing on racial ideas. Like that's the problem that I want to, that I want to fix so that I can enjoy orcs because orcs are like, um, you know, I, one thing that I avoid saying is like, a lot of people say like, yo, orcs are racist. You know, if you're just trying to like, you know, stuff it in your Twitter bio, I assume I, um, I know a lot of people like phrase things in that way. And mm -hmm. like, I've stopped, uh, I've changed the way that I phrased it because um, like people, people think that I've arrived at the idea that like anybody putting orcs in anything is, is racist. And that's not what I mean. Um, like, I, I think orcs are awesome because I was raised with these like complicated orcs from warcraft who were like cool in some ways but then i realized like oh wait they're not cool in some other ways and um i'm i'm always thinking about like the next the next cool orc i made up i make up as like a like a dnd character i'm thinking about like what can i do such that i'll like i'll enjoy that experience playing as that orc as mm -hmm. a person who's had like experiences having to do with race in my real life right. um so yeah like this is if it's always telling people of color like why are you making it about race uh we're making it about race because our real life is experienced our real life experience is about race all of it's about race mm -hmm. and race affects everything that we do um and if we you know it would be cool if we could live lives where that doesn't affect our doesn't affect our life but racial signifiers are built into everything it's you know it's how we get like quote unquote indoctrinated and everybody takes in racist ideas me included like i was saying earlier about like all the mistakes that i've made leading to my own work as a cultural consultant so we all get that racial indoctrination because we encounter racial ideas whether we intend to or not nobody and you know every time someone tells me like well i was raised without those or my kids are going to get raised without those i'm like it's cool if you manage to avoid that but uh <laughs> everyone who tells me those things turns out to be really racist so <laughs> or just like kind of well-meaning and like but letting things pass that like we right. shouldn't be letting pass right right so okay i mean 
I think that there that that gut instinct, right? You remember you mentioned before about gut instinct, like you know, mm-hmm. someone like yourself, you know, like the two of us mentioning on a thread or on a video or whatever it is, Absolutely, we, yeah. we say a racial thing, and then there's that guttural like reaction. No, 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 don't make it about race. And yeah. I think it comes from kind of the fusion of two things, like mm-hmm. talking about race and no fun. Talking yeah. about race and taking away my stuff, canceling or yeah. whatever we call it. And like I think people have fused those two ideas. And yeah, and I think like, like for us, like I love this stuff. I, like I, I totally mm-hmm. agree with you. This is these are conversations I want to have. Like talking yeah. about like you know, and not just like race, but like I, I you know, race is kind of a bad word. Like in a culture, mm-hmm. I, I tend to use culture yeah. more because like I think you know, like instantiated peoples, and you can have like non-racial cultures. You can have like I love talking about that. Like yeah. you know, in terms of like the the shared worldview of people getting together. So yeah. like I think talking about culture is fun and it's interesting and it's fraught, but like, you know, the fraughtness can result in some good stuff later. And so mm-hmm. like, for me talking about this stuff, does it equate to take it away? Mm-hmm. And I think like social media encourages that kind of fusion because like, okay, we're also racist, you know, like that we got to put that in our bio. That's going to get the clicks. It's going to get the, mm-hmm. <laughs> the whatever. Yeah. So social media is not definitely not helping, but I think like one of the reasons I wanted to do this was like to kind of dread, like you, you, we went, we're right there. Like, you know, addressing that idea that like, we're trying to take stuff away by talking about this stuff. And it's like yeah. our cudgel, right? You know, right. racist, racist, cancel it. Da, 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 da. And it's like, yeah, some people, maybe I'm not sure, but mm-hmm. I think a lot, I love at least the people that I talk to. And I've talked to a lot of people at this point on my show. We don't want that, but we just yeah. like, we want to, you know, like really be smart about yeah. this stuff and make it better. As we were saying before. Definitely. Um. So, yeah, I think that uh, that, that instinct. Um, okay, again, talk, going back to like, I keep coming back to indoctrination, right? So where did oh, I where set did you off with that word? From? You're like, ooh, yeah. <laughs> ooh yeah, that one's like this a... is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. right. So well, because you're um, a religion guy, so it's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> there it is. So so I think in terms of um, I think in terms of indoctrination, in terms of what gives us those ideas and what gives us that like immediate like emotional response to things, sure. um, a lot of the time. Uh, I think that you can trace those reactions back to your past experiences, your real life experience. Um, And uh, uh, I think a lot of people who uh, shy away from conversations about race or feel uncomfortable when something is made about race um, have had an experience in the past where they've tried to talk about race and something bad has happened. Um, And uh, that's like a that's like a totally totally normal reaction but like if someone who feels uncomfortable with that like talks to me about it for a long time usually we can when i talk about like your history talking about these kinds of concepts it goes back to a time in their past when they talked to someone who disagreed with them and that person was like mean or short or frustrated them or when they got something wrong in public and someone humiliated them or they were trying to express an idea and it didn't come out right and people lashed out at them, like one of those things. Um, And uh, a lot of people's uh, like own racial biases come from like experiences like this that they sometimes are and sometimes aren't able to like unpack. But um, I think for me, one of the things that made this this concept easiest to approach uh, was martial arts. Mm, Okay. So, I wasn't very good at sports as a kid um, and I did wrestling and I was really bad at it. Um, but uh, being really bad at wrestling and wrestling people anyway and having to figure out how I'm gonna win when I'm you know, smaller and, and weaker than, than everybody else and I have less muscles than this guy who weighs the same as me. Um, figuring that out um, helped me get over that like initial like flush of fear and discomfort that hits me when someone disagrees with me. And they could be calling me racist, but they could say, why are you making it about race? Um, whichever kind of negative reaction that that hits me, like I have a physical reaction that I've become familiar with where like I get flushed and like tingling and I feel uh, like too hot. Um, and, you know, may- maybe I break out in a sweat, something like that. Um, and uh, doing martial arts and consistently like throwing myself into situations where like, yeah, this guy could like punch and kick me and knock me down. Yeah, she's much faster than me. And I know she's gonna like punch me a hundred times every time I punch her 10 times. Being in those situations helped me realize like, well, maybe I can 
I can approach dangerous and scary situations. And um, if I'm patient um, and I look out for like the real dangers, then I can come out of it better. And I realized that like, I didn't get good at talking about race by automatically being good at talking about race. I was terrible at it for most of my life. Sure. Like I just told you, like mm-hmm. I was into those like colorblindness ideas and everything. And um, I found that like over the series of long conversations about race, those ideas didn't hold up. And so I, I practiced and I kept throwing myself into them and I got good at them by doing things that I was bad at. If someone had canceled me, right? If someone had told me like, no, you're not allowed to have these conversations when I was like a kid, Mm -hmm. um, then I never would have learned that. But I had other people who were like patient with me the same way I try to be patient with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, it's not the, it's not the same on like on Twitter or with like random strangers, right? Because you don't know whether that person's going to listen to you. Um, And yeah, like the, you know, the random person on Twitter showing up with like two followers and an avatar of like Pepe the frog or something like that. You don't like, first of all, that conversation is not fun, right? I get in these conversations because I like them and talking to like a rando who isn't actually going to listen to you. That's not fun. I would only do that if I get paid to do it, which sometimes I do. Um, uh, but like for other people, um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta practice. You gotta, you gotta get good at them. And if I, if I were to talk about like any other subject that I'm, uh, that I'm not good at now, if I wanted to learn about like macroeconomics or tennis, um, mm-hmm. I'd have to spend a long time being bad at those conversations before I can get good at those conversations. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned that. You, you touched a couple of things I want to like, you know, address. So first of all, kind of this idea of like making mistakes and getting better. I think there's a idea on the moderate side that like there is no forgiveness like once you are once you make a a statement then you're done that's what whole that's the whole point of what canceling is you're done you're fired you're (sighs) you know you cannot do whatever and like that's the the if like you know the the idea of like getting called a mob like you know mobs don't offer forgiveness like mobs don't they want they want their pound of flesh uh and so like there's this idea that like uh you know a progressive side the woke side and i don't like the word woke but whatever um you know, like we're, we're, we're not tolerant of people's mistakes. We don't let people grow. Mm-hmm. Right. And so what would you say to that particular criticism? And then I have a follow-up. So um, in, in that case, I'd say like, I, I try to surround myself with people who are good at talking about this. And th- so the problem with like, the problem with looking at the internet as like a sample size is that like the internet is full of you know people with one follower and a pepe avatar and presumably there's an equivalent of that like a leftist equivalent of that i don't know what it is um but uh people people on twitter they don't have an incentive to be patient with you because they're just going on twitter on their lunch break so um it's really really easy for mobs to form um and for large numbers of people to like get a misconception about you and then jump down your throat. Like there was a, uh, a I did an extra credits video recently about, um, you know, how like uh, bioessentialism and game design. Um, and we got all of these people who were calling us racist because at the beginning of the, um, at the beginning of the video, there's, there's uh, a disclaimer that says, yeah, so there's a conversation about like evil races and whether or not they're like racist against real people. And we're not going to have that conversation. You can go click this link if you want to have it someplace else. Mm -hmm. Um, So people were calling us racist because we had a link saying we're not going to talk about race. Um, People were like, well, uh, why are you making it about race? But but we, okay. Um, So like internet mobs can form about anything. They can get misconceptions about lots of different things. Um, So I have to like, there's a certain amount of like, you know, noise to signal ratio from the internet that I just have to set aside because I don't have time to engage with all of it. Um, yeah, I think there's this expectation and, you know, like the, you get this every curf- like kerfuffle kind of happen in the, the tabletop gaming or whatever. And then there's this idea that like, you know, once the, the mob starts to form and it's like, you know, mm-hmm. oh, don't do this, do this. And I use mob and scare quotes or whatever. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you'll see conservative people and they'll come on, you know, my channel and they'll say, okay, condemn that. You know, that's mm-hmm. bad. You need to condemn that. 
you know, because, yeah. uh, you know, they're calling for his job. They're calling for her thing. They're do, 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 do. So you got to condemn that or else, you know, you have to have empathy for him. You know, uh, they're, they're losing their livelihood. They're, they're being slandered and all kind of stuff. And I don't know, like, I mean, have you, have you ever encountered have... that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that kind of thing, but like, I don't have, um, like there was, uh, I remember there was an argument about like, uh, Islamist, Islamist terrorism where someone was like, someone was like, why don't, why don't uh, moderate Muslims condemn the extremists? And I just like, I just tagged in my friend from the dojo and I was like, Shah, this guy wants you to condemn some extremist Muslims, do it. <laughs> and my friend was like, well, I'd love to catch some Muslim terrorists, but like, I'm not Batman, I work yeah. for the parks department. <laughs> right. um, so like, there's, there are too many things on the internet um, for us to react to or condemn right um like again like we have like we have channels we talk about the stuff that we want to um so like if, if someone's like in a um it, and then a, a lot of the time um uh, the, the other one that i get in a lot is like when people talk about protests and looting um and you're trying to have a conversation about like lives that matter um and someone's like but someone set a target on fire and uh, like i i don't know what conversation they want me to have then i'm like yeah sure it was bad they set a target on fire what you got to condemn mean? the looters they're looters and rioters you know that's that's a the storefront and you you know how could you defend these people blah 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 so so the so when when someone tells me like well what about this when someone does like the what about um you know in previous generations the what about chapaquitic you know um you have to, I have to look at that because usually it's coming from the internet. It's one thing if like you're my friend and we're having a conversation about this, then we'll I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as like, as long as there's still coffee, you know, we'll, I'll keep talking about whatever, mm -hmm. um, cancel culture, like all types of things I hate talking about. If you're my friend, I'll talk about anything with you. If you're a random person on the internet, I have to look at your communication and I have to figure out whether this is like a good faith thing or right. whether you're just trying to get me to like react in a certain way mm -hmm. and presumably people like all over the political spectrum anyone who's even vaguely public or even a little bit online um has to look at all of these interactions and they have to decide which of these am i going to spend my time on and a lot of the time like you know if people are leaving me comments i'll just respond to the ones that agree with me because it's quicker like I just don't like if someone's like, yeah, I agree. This is what I think. And I'm like, yeah, sure. That's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't like if someone's like, I disagree with you. Why don't you condemn all of these things? What about all these problems in your argument? Right. I only have so many hours during the day and I'm a freelancer. So like, I, you know, I mostly interact with like people who I, if it's like randos on Twitter, like I'm mostly going to interact with like people who agree with me because it's safe and because it's easy and because it's quick. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, like it's it's my job to make sure that like that doesn't bias me too much, that I'm understanding like the influences of who I'm interacting with. But like, um, there's all of these. If you want to call me on like being wrong about something, um, the communication has to convince me that like, if I spend time responding to you, um, it's not going to be a trap. Mm -hmm. um, and if like you know, if I tweeted at like random right-wing talking head, uh, Jordan Peterson or something like that. Um, he's He has no reason to respond to this random person he doesn't know unless I were able to convince him that like he actually, um, convince him that like there's a reason I need to give him an incentive to interact with me mm -hmm. um, because what differentiates me from all of the people who are tweeting at him in bad faith? Um, so, yeah, like people on the internet, like, uh, you know, I can't tell uh, people who disagree with me, like, I, I appreciate that you're engaging, but I need to be able to tell you apart from like junk man. Right, right. Um, and it's, I mean, there's some, I'm not going to completely excuse what goes on, on, you know, the progressive side. I mean, I'd say there is, you know, it's social media, there's a lot of ju uh, gun jumping. And I think that some things have happened that I, I personally don't, dis do, don't agree with on my side, you know, I think we can be too quick and I'll get to that in just a second um, yeah. to kind of condemn or, or like, you know, make quick judgments on kind of stuff. However, I don't feel like it's my place to like, you know, 
make the, you know, placate the rando. Like at the end of the day, like there are people who are out there that are like, okay, maybe you know who you are. You're a perfectly nice person and you're trying to, you know, stand up for something, but I don't know who you are. Yeah. And I don't know what you are, like what your motivation is. I'm like, okay, getting me or somebody else to say something against this, that, and the third mm-hmm. thing. I, you know, I, I generally, t- I try to be like reflective anyway. So it's mm-hmm. like, okay, uh, this is happening. What are like, I'm, I'm a, like a psychotherapist. So like, okay, what are the un- unmet needs of both sides? I'm very like, you know, <laughs> trying yeah, yeah. to understand the humanity of things. And like in the processing of the humanity of both sides, it's like, you get that inter- interjection. And I think you're the same way. Like you try to understand and yeah. there's a certain empathy that comes into, you know, these, these arguments and that takes time to process. And it's like, no, I'm not, I, I'll just like say it blankly. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to. And if it, mm-hmm. if the, the situation kind of keeps on going on, there's like, you know, like something's really going off the rails and maybe if I can, if my voice can sound something positive, yeah. but for the most part, it's like, what, what is that going to do? I'm not going to yeah. know. I'm not going to, like, that, that is not and, something I can engage in, especially you know, prompted by at the end of the day, I, I like, I like how you said it. And it kind of helped me crystallize my thought some rando. Yeah. And one thing that I, one thing that I will say is that like when enough comments from these randos pile up, eventually, like once there's enough of them, like usually I'll write an article about it or like do an interview about it. So random, so, you know, we're doing random. (laughs) Yeah. That's what we're doing here. So random follower with, you know, a Pepe avatar uh, who only tweets things about Hitler. Here's your response. You got it. You win. So like, (laughs) um, but yeah, that's like one of the frustrating things is like a lot of the people who uh, are criticizing some argument that I made about orcs, they're like, no, this is wrong because something, and I'm like, I wrote two whole articles. I have 12,000 words on the internet that I already wrote responding to your argument, mm-hmm. like in various different ways. Um, and you seem not to have read them. So what am I going to tell you now that I didn't already tell you in the article that you responded to a tweet about without reading? Okay, so I got one last one, and the, 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 and not everybody who disagrees has a Pepe flag. I just want to make that clear right now. There's a lot of perfectly nice people who I've met on both sides. We, I hope we come to a agree disagree point. You know, just kind of like, yeah. you know, could, please if you disagree, I, I my door is open. I'm welcome to engaging up to a point because that's another mm-hmm. thing that happens where it's like I'll engage. It is exhausting, but then conversations go from like you know mutual sharing to like trying to convince. Oh well, why don't you see it for this way? And like, once I get to that point, then I'm like, okay, I got it. Mm-hmm. We got we're, we just gotta agree to disagree. We're good. Yeah. Um. So, and I got this comment. It really stuck with me, of like someone who is actually friendly to like a, the progressive side, but they're kind of like earlier on that journey, right? Still kind of mm-hmm. in that mistake making, you know, like okay, what's this? What's this? What's this? And I got the comment that like they, they never, they don't know. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. they get unsure. It's like, okay, something you look at something and it's like, I don't know, is that racist or not? You know, Mm -hmm. if I say it's racist, whatever, or like they'll say something, it's like, okay, red M&Ms are racist. It's like, what? (laughs) You know, and they'll, 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 you know, they'll just, you know, Mm -hmm. well-meaning, you know, going off the indoctrination or whatever it is, everything is racist. So red M&Ms must be racist. Uh, And so like, there's a, like, how do you talk to that person? You know, maybe that is um, like a younger you. How to maybe that is like a, a a person who's just figuring out this whole, you know, like race and cultural consciousness type stuff. How do you guide them through the idea that like it really is certain things and not other things? How do you help them in that discernment process? So I would I would tell that person that um, that that moment of like not being sure of recognizing the complexity in something that you're looking at of realizing that there's like factors saying yes and no and pushing you in different directions. Don't lose that. Don't lose that feeling of insecurity because that feeling of not being sure of wanting to find out more, that's what drives you forward. And that's what like, that's what keeps getting me interested in these situations because, um, you know, like when, when we talk about cultural appropriation, this is when this thing that you're talking about comes up. People are like, where's the line? How do I know what is and what isn't? Right. And I always say when I talk about cultural appropriation, no, no drawing lines. I'm not going to tell you for sure when, whether anything like is always racist or always not, not racist, always appropriation, always not appropriation. Cause I want us to look at each of these situations on its own merits in, in its own context. I want to see like every instance of this and I want to be able to like have a discussion with it, with 
uh, with other people or like nobody's around, like I'll argue with myself. I'll argue with that part of my brain that like, tells me I'm wrong about everything. Um, so <laughs> that if <dirty> you're rat. <laughs> exactly so, so if you have that, if you look at something and you're not sure, um, like we, we often react to that situation with fear, but I think that, um, like I've learned to love that feeling and I've learned to like, see that as like my compass, my thing, pushing me forward, wanting to know, wanting to come up with the answer. Um, so I would say, don't, don't get comfortable. Don't, uh, and if you, if you reach a place where you know, where you're sure, like push yourself further. And I'm, you know, I'm still on that journey, right? Like I'm, I, I'm at this point where like, I can make a lot of definitive statements about orcs, for example, but there's other related ideas that I'm not sure about. What about demons? Can angels and demons be good and evil? What about robots? Is it okay to fight against robots? What about droids? What about terminators and stuff? So there's like, there's uncharted territory there that I'm going to push myself into where I look at those things and I'm not sure. Um, but that means that, that means that I'm still going, I'm still going forward. So um, the same, the same way as like, you know, if I go into a fight, I'm not sure whether I'm going to win. I'm not sure what kind of tactics and styles the other person is going to, going to use. But if I learn to see that moment, um, of like, I might get hit, but also I might learn something and I might have this amazing interaction with this person. Um, if I learn to like chase that situation and let that impulse drive me forward, that's, that's what, that's why I keep doing this. And when people say like, this isn't fun um, or like, I, d I don't like these conversations. Um, sometimes I, I feel so far away from them because like from where I'm standing, like it's fascinating to talk about these things. And especially like the most it. complicated instances of this, like the Wu-Tang Clan, right? What about the Wu-Tang Clan and cultural appropriation? Mm -hmm. um, right, like that, that's, a, that's a problem that I will be turning over until the end of my life. That's my koan, you know? <laughs> Um, it makes me uncomfortable but i can't turn away <laughs> right exactly so so that that feeling of like intellectual discomfort when you're not sure um don't ever if you're feeling that don't ever let go of it like let that like drive you forward let that guide you forward and let that push you forward from behind because that's we can't keep doing this work we can't keep learning more unless we have that feeling mm -hmm. and that becomes it's an interesting place to because we kind of come to a, a, a settled point like I think the process of cultural consulting, I've heard uh, another person say this and I'm stealing it. Um, yeah. It is the process of democratizing discomfort. Like we're taking discomfort and we are spreading it out to people and not everybody wants to be uncomfortable. The, yeah. People like their settledness, people like their ideas and, the, and you know, having people encounter discomfort as like threatening. People yeah. encounter criticism as cancellation and that's not like, I can't take responsibility for that, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. I think that you, you, you would kind of be in the same place the way you talk about discomfort that like, you know, okay, my goal in life is to make you uncomfortable <laughs> mm -hmm. and, to, and to continue in my own discomfort, my own processing, like, hmm, but our red, our red M's, red m and really racist. I, I don't think yeah. so, but I'm willing to hear the argument, yeah. whatever, whatever. And yeah. I think people get very scared by that, mm -hmm. but eh, you got to understand where we're coming from. Please don't negate our experience that like, we love this. Right. And I can promise you that if I do say your game is whatever, or your product is whatever, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to work and help bring about a better version mm -hmm. of that. I wouldn't want yeah. to take any fun away. Exactly. And like, if you, if you, if you want to avoid that stuff, if you, the first time anyone criticizes me, I'm like, well, you, if you, if you're, if you're criticizing me for making everything about race and you say to me, why you have to make everything about race? Well, now you're in a conversation about race. If you want me to respond to you, now we're having a conversation about race. So do you wanna have that? Right. So, and, and like for, for all people of color, you know, we'll all say, you know, in this situation, um, you know, I didn't choose the thug life, the thug life chose me. We, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. our experiences as people of color mm -hmm. Rate, we didn't want it to be about race, but race came and found us mm -hmm. and race pulled us out of bed and race made us think like, confront this violence, confront this harm, confront this uh, you know, misconception that people are gonna have about you and these stereotypes that people are gonna apply to you all the time. You don't get to opt out of this conversation. You don't get to, um, race, race made it about race. Mm -hmm. And we don't, 
we can't we can't opt out of that we can't um, opt so, out of the discomfort and because you are able to be comfortable exactly <laughs> we are going yeah. to share our discomfort but we're going to try to do so as i say in a spirit of education and compassion yeah. and, and like we can only speak the two of us i'm sure there's other people that are like you know bringing the fire and torch and everything i can't speak for that i can right. only speak for that's not people that yeah like that's it. not the that's not the mindset that i bring to it the mindset that i bring to it is one of joy right. and one of like enthusiastically and excitedly engaging with these things and it's harder for me to do that than if i'm engaging with like an issue that uh that uh, affects women, that doesn't affect me, right? Like that's gonna be harder. There's gonna be more for me to get over, but knowing that I had this capability in another realm to approach that topic with joy, I know I'm gonna be able to do this with joy even when it comes to something that doesn't come as natural to me. Something that comes where, where like maybe I'm the oppressor and other people have to call me on my oppression. Like when I approach those situations where I'm less comfortable, I have to remember I can do this. I can do it because I, I know I've been able to do it in another conversation. And even for the person who like, if you have all the privileges and people about you keep making things about race, quote unquote, right? Well, think about how joyfully you engage in a conversation about, I don't know, loot boxes or worker placement <laughs> or something like that. Right. Um, and bring that bring that joy and that enthusiasm to like the conversation about race and like yeah people will complain that you're approaching a conversation about race the same way you approach conversations about loot boxes or worker placement but that's a phase you got to go through because you gotta you gotta get called on that and learn so right. when when people criticize you when people you know tell you to shut up or go away which is you know which is their right um don't don't lose the joy like hold on to that um, and let it, let it keep pushing you forward because like, yeah, when I do cultural consulting, you know, like I said at the beginning, I'm not just telling you, no, this is bad. Don't do it. I'm saying, what can we do instead? That's even cooler that both of us love. And that's what, you know, like we try to defuse ideas. We're trying to defuse the idea that mm -hmm. talking about race means take, get taken away stuff. That is not what we're all about. And I yeah. think it's a great place to end at this moment of joy. I can see like, you know, we're an hour and some odd into this conversation. You're like, all right, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is the best. So, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the beat goes on. You are a freelancer. You are a person who is going to be, you know, continuing to do this in the TTRPG and the board gaming space. So tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about like your website and how we can find yeah, you and sure. what's coming so up. So uh, I'm at jamesmendezhodes.com. Uh, so you can go there. You can find all the stuff that I'm working on. Um, right now, uh, I'm doing a lot of work on the uh, the Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra role-playing game. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty exciting. And I'm doing a lot of cultural consulting, uh, some of which I can talk about, some of which I can't talk about. I've been doing a lot of stuff for uh, uh, Magic the Gathering recently, wow. learning a lot about like collectible card games. Um, and uh, so you can, so jamesmendeshodes.com, that's also where my blog is. You can find a lot of articles about these topics. Um, and then I'm, uh, I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash MNDZ, Mike November Delta Zebra. Yeah. Um, if you want to actually throw money at my articles when they come out like once every few months. Sure. Um, and then uh, if you want to tell me that I'm the real racist, uh, follow me on Twitter at uh, Lula Vampiro. Um, and I promise you that even though if you call me a racist on Twitter, um, I won't, I probably won't respond, uh, especially if you have one follower and a Hitler avatar, but I promise you that I will feel bad for a split second before I click away. <laughs> we'll have the way a you've moment, been educated. <laughs> I see all of them. I see all the notifications sure. uh, and I think about them for almost a whole second each. Mendez, my if, friend, this was a this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for so, so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was awesome. If you could change your mind, you could change the world. So until next time, later, everybody. Peace.